Okay, so the Snow Queen, as told by Marlene Peterson, um, well-educated heart. So um, I sent this out in my um, in my email this week to the moms that are part of that, and um, and then I wanted to talk about it today. So let me just do kind of a quick review of that story, and hopefully, as these last moms. Um, come on, they they won't miss too much because um, and then we'll talk about it. So, so here we go. So this is Hans Christian Andersen. It's the story that was the um, oh yeah right. I did that class from Hillsdale too. Okay, that was a fabulous class. Um, so it's the story that Frozen was based on, but Frozen is really not not like the story. Um, and there's a lot more to this because there's a whole middle part. But this is what I'm going to share with you from Marlene's um, storytelling. So here we go. So now it's like I said, it's story time for the mamas today. So, um, so the, and this story was written 150 years ago, warning us of the dangers that we're facing right now. And so I, um, I want that to be kind of the topic, at least for this little personal segment. Um, all right. Long, long ago, there lived a hobgoblin, a demon, really, who one day made a mirror that had a particular power. Everything that was good or beautiful that was reflected in it was made to look small and ugly, while everything that was bad or ugly was magnified and every little fault could be plainly seen. The scholars in his demon school carried the mirror all over the world until there wasn't a land or a people who had not been looked, who had not been looked at in this distorted mirror. They thought it would look even funnier if they could carry it high up into the heavens to look at the angels in it. But the higher they rose, the slipper, slipperier the mirror became until it slipped from their fingers and crashed to the earth, shattering into millions of pieces. Now the mirror caused even more unhappiness. For if a speck no larger than a grain of sand lodged in a person's eye, it had the property of the whole mirror, and they viewed everything the wrong way. They could neither see rightly or justly. And even worse, if a tiny shard entered into the heart, the heart grew as cold as ice. The pieces soon covered the whole earth. The demon laughed so hard at the mischief he had caused that he nearly split his sides. Now, in a large town lived two poor little children who loved each other dearly. Kay and Gerda often played under the red rose bush that grew near their homes. One day, just as the clock struck 12, Kay said, Oh, something has struck my heart and it feels like there's something in my eye. When Gerda asked what was wrong and started to cry, Kay mockingly, mockingly told her to stop crying because she looked so ugly when she cried. There was nothing wrong with him, he said, but look, look at the worm on that rose and why is that rose crooked? And what an ugly little box they grow in. He kicked the box and ripped off the two roses as he ran off to play with the boys. By and by, he began to make fun of the townspeople, and the people laughed and thought he was very clever. He now thought the picture books and stories his grandmother told were very stupid. One day, as he was playing on his sleigh, a large white sleigh carrying a white figure wrapped in white fur circled the field. Kay was intrigued, grabbed hold of the back of the sleigh, and off they flew. Faster and faster they went. He tried to let go, but he couldn't. He was afraid and tried to pray, but all he could remember were his multiplication tables. At long last, the sleigh stopped and the driver stood up. She was tall and beautiful, a snow queen. She opened her warm fur coat for Kay to snuggle in. Are you still cold, she asked as she kissed his forehead. Although his heart was now almost a lump of ice, he somehow no longer felt cold or afraid. He thought the face of the snow queen was the most beautiful he had ever seen. He could imagine nothing more perfect. He proudly told her he could do arithmetic as far as fractions in his head and that he knew the number of square miles and number of inhabitants in the country. And the Snow Queen smiled. Off they flew again over woods and lakes, over sea and land, and Kay felt perfectly safe. Meanwhile, little Gerda didn't believe what the townspeople said, that Kay must have drowned in the river. She set off to search for him and after a hard and difficult journey, arrived at the magnificent ice palace of the Snow Queen. There were hundreds of empty, vast and cold rooms in the palace, all made of drifted snow. The largest hall stretched for several miles. 
In the midst of this empty, endless hall of snow was a frozen lake, and there, in the center of it, stood the Snow Queen. She called the lake the Mirror of Reason and said it was the best and indeed the only one in the world. When Gerda finally found little Kay, he was quite blue with cold, almost black. But he didn't feel it, for the Snow Queen had kissed away his icy shivering. There he was, dragging sharp, flat pieces of ice to and fro, trying to get them to fit together in different ways. It was the icy game of reason he was playing, and in his eyes, the figures he created were very remarkable and of the highest importance. Yet, try though he may, he could not create the one figure he desperately wanted to make. He was trying to form the word eternity, for the Snow Queen had told him, when you find out this, you shall be your own master, and I will give you the whole world and a new pair of skates. Gerda ran to Kay and threw her arms around his neck. Kay, dear Kay, I found you at last. But he sat quite still, stiff and cold. Then Gerda wept hot tears that penetrated his heart and began to melt the lump of ice until Kay also burst into tears, washing away the speck that had lodged in his eye. Gerda, where have you been and where am I? As he looked all around him, he exclaimed, how cold it is and how large and empty it all looks. The two danced, crying tears of joy, until they fell to the ground, wrapped in each other's arms. And as they lay there, their figure formed at last the word eternity, and Kay was forever free from the Snow Queen's power. The two made their way back to their red rose bush, where they both sat, grown up, yet children at heart, and it was summer, warm, beautiful summer. <clears throat> so that's her story. So um, just for a moment, I want to see if, if you ladies would like to discuss a little bit this story and how you think uh, what your ideas are, how this would tie in to um, educating your children or today's world or education now, or what you would like to do with your, your children. I could, somebody was asking me recently, um, how do you find me time? And uh, as a mom and a wife and all the callings or the responsibilities that we have, we wear many, many hats as homeschool moms. And then you just add teacher and it's not just teacher, you have, you know, chauffeur and you have field trip advisor and you like, there's so many, so many hats that we wear as moms. I think the one thing that I've learned um, over the years is to take time for myself that if I feel depleted um, or emotionally, um, you know, wanting to distance myself from other people, then I, I real then I, it's a clue, a, a, you know, clue to me that I need to tune in to myself a little bit and I need to um, have some me time. And I've also learned not to just tune out to, for example, it would be so easy to just get on a social media platform and just tune out and do nothing. And, and if that's nourishing, great, but sometimes it's not, it's actually, you know, I, it's counter productive for me sometimes. So I've, I've, I've learned that if I have a window of time, it's going to be short likely, and I need to use that wisely. And so I have had to stop and think, okay, if, I, if this is my window of time, how should I use it so that I am full? I need something, I need to choose something to fill my cup. And um, so a lot of times I will stop and think, what is it that really truly fills me and fills me quickly in case that window of time is shorter than I think it's going to be or shortened or someone needs me, you know, in another way. So, um, uh, you know, it, everyone is different just, but I, I might, if I could suggest anything right now, it would be to think about what it is that fills you and fills you quickly. Um, if it's a date night, then plan one. Don't wait for your husband to plan one. Do it. You plan it. You do something, you know, at least that's what, um, it, it, that way you know that it's going to at least happen or, um, or try. Or a girl's night out, I thrive on mom's nights out. I love those. Um, uh, reading a book, if it's the right kind of book, 
is really nourishing to me. Um, and of course, reading the scriptures and um, sometimes turning, tuning into or finding a, a, a musician that I really enjoy. So those are some things that, the tips that I would suggest. Think ahead of time, even. Like if you go, oh, I really want to do this someday. Someday I'm going to get to this. That's your time. Take that time and go do it at that moment. And then when you are, you know, hopefully fulfilled or when you're needed or your time is up, then you've been able to check that off your list and something that's nourishing, something that's uplifting. Any other thoughts or comments on that? <laughs> Is that what you were thinking, Kathy? <laughs> yeah, that's great. I was thinking as you were talking, um, one of the moms asked earlier um, this week also about how do we juggle it all with little ones and teenage ones and the house and, and yourself and your learning and things like that. And I think that you need to start with yourself. And I think about, um, that may sound selfish, but think about on the... Um, airplane when they say to put the oxygen mask on yourself first you know you have to be you've got to be settled and ready to go um and as moms i think that in the morning you do your routine gets your home comfortable enough where you can sit down and do whatever activity or um if you want to do a formal lesson you can it's whatever your style is or get your kids in engaged in things but i think it's important to um have yourself you know comfortable and ready to go first so if I'm still in my pajamas and the kitchen's a mess and my kids are not dressed or they're this way or that way and no one's kind of grouped together, then it's not going to go well, no matter what. So I sometimes don't start anything till my house is all picked up and every, everyone feels calmer and I showered and ready. And, and until then, it's just kind of life. I don't say, mm -hmm. oh, we're not getting this done on time. I don't worry about time. It, it, we don't have to punch a clock. And it's, it's more about, you know, the flow. Yeah. It's more about the flow and the spirit, the feeling in our home. Um, I was going to say, if your first time or first few years or whatever, remember that it's going to be difficult. And even though I've been doing this over 10 years, I still have hard days trying to make my ideal in my mind match my reality. And, um, I still miss my time because I still have little ones from four all the way to 18 in my house. So I'm struggling still. So that just, just, just know that that's going to always be part of your makeup from this point on as a homeschooling mom is that you're going to need to learn the balance and how to figure out how you maneuver through that in life. Um, I think a lot of new homeschooling moms think that, they're going to have their new curriculum, their new routine, and their cute little schoolroom, and they're going to set up and go, whoa, it's awesome, and the kids are going to love it, and I thought that too, and it didn't work out um, like that, and so for years, it was a struggle, so I think sometimes we paint a rosy picture thinking it's going to be just easy, or just do this and plug and play, but it's never that way. Well, maybe for some people, but I've never met anybody. <laughs> I've never met <laughs> Don't you find that it does get easier? I think mostly because I'm not as hard on myself. Oh, yeah. I think we're in our seventh or eighth year of homeschooling. But of course, I was raised homeschooled as well, K through 12. So, but it's different being on the teacher end. But I'm less critical of myself than I used to be. Um, Definitely. Not that my expectations have come down. It's that they've adapted to what is more uh, realistic. Realistic, and yes. And pleasant. <laughs> I have to admit, it is so much better that I, when I'm not criticizing my myself, and um, it's so much better. Um, but this is the meme, basically, that I wanted to share. It's um, relationships before rigor, grace before grades, patience before programs, and love before lessons. And this is, you probably, if you've seen it, the reason I love that so much is because, um, you know, you have that one kid that just pushes your buttons a lot and that's like, uh, or, or likes to get on your last nerve. And sometimes it's so much easier to just be that harsh mom and be like, look, you've got to get your chores done. You've got to get, your, this has to be done. And you end up becoming the bad guy you know, because somebody has to make sure that, it, that a child is learning and growing. And, and so, um, but 
and and it is it's important to follow through and and teach them choices and consequences and on all of that that's not diminishing that at all but i also um this one reminds me that uh, relationships are also really important um, and connecting with them and finding that time. I, f I find if with myself even now, I don't always play, I don't play enough with my kids. I don't relax and enjoy, I do enjoy being with them and we do have family, lots of family time, but um, I don't always take the time to just play and be a kid or play, get down on their level and, and play. Um, so I I've made a mental note when I saw that meme, I made a mental note to be more a part of their lives, not just the, the overseer, not just the teacher, not just the, you know, um, um, facilitator making sure things are happening. They, that is important. And, but um, every once in a while, I need to um, pause and participate in their playtime. Now, not too often because nothing would get done around here, right? But there's that, it's, it's balance. It is really balance. And a lot of times when I'm filled, when my cup is filled, I can recognize where I need to be at the right place and time and what I need to be doing. But if my cup is empty, I'm a mess. You know, like nobody really benefits from me. <laughs> so is that helpful? Any thoughts on that? I, I'm sure these are things that every one of us are learning and relearning over and over again. And it's a beautiful journey. I'm learning to celebrate it more and more, especially as my kids get older. And, ah, they're turning out to be great kids. And I'm like, this is wonderful. I worried about this. Now I'm no, no. it's gonna be okay. They're they're good people. They're learning and growing. <laughs> so so we all are. Okay, so Snow Queen. This the message there is talking about the fact that we get ourselves um, so worried about the academics and we're not thinking about their hearts and, and um, teaching to our child's hearts, helping their hearts to be filled with good, wonderful things. And so for the moms that are just starting out, honestly, being able to just sit back and take a moment to breathe, get yourself kind of squared away, just play with your kids. I know I say this every time and I think it scares moms, um, but playing with your kids, reading stories to your children, that warms their hearts and it prepares them to receive all the rest of the stuff that you're gonna need to do with them. Doing the education part, the things that seem more school-like, those math and science and the English grammar, all those kinds of topics, those can seem a little overwhelming to us as moms. Um, we maybe get a lot of negative feedback from our kids as we're trying to do those things, but often <clears throat> we prepare their hearts first and spend some time doing the stories and spend some time in the arts that starts to open their hearts up a little bit more to the other things that we need to offer them. The world has adopted the ideas of the, the Snow Queen, that kind of a mentality, where it's all about the intellect. If you go back in time, when Marlene talks about that, she talks about the people in the time of, in Greece and how the people there knew and understood about the arts and the importance of the arts and storytelling and music and all of those wonderful things. And they used those. That's what they loved to talk about. And they also talked about reason and intellect and they used their minds and all of that. But they started with the heart. And that's what they focused on. Then the Romans in that time period, they moved more to the intellect and they were, it was a much, much more of a focus on that and not a focus on the art. And we find after that time period that there was a time of uh, dark ages where there wasn't a lot of learning and growth and knowledge and development. And it kind of is this cycle and it's happened in, in history. It's happened in different cultures multiple times. And we're, we're in that cycle again, and we're more in that, um, the intellect part, where that's where we're focused on and what we have been focused on in education for a long time. And we're seeing the fruits of that in our young adults. And the fact that they, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them had that really mind-based learning and didn't fill their hearts and don't have the stories 
don't have that knowledge as their base and, and they're really lost and they're getting kind of sucked away, sucked into these um, ideologies and things that are being taught out there. They don't have an alternate, an alternative story to help them to balance and weigh the things that they're reading, seeing on social media, things like that. Um, maybe some of us had a little bit different experience. Maybe our parents shared with us stories and maybe we had a different mind frame. I don't know where you feel like you are today in today's um, what political arena, where how you're feeling about things. But I think we see that we've got this missing heart component. And so this wonderful opportunity of being able to school your children at home, you have time to be able to do this with them. You have time, I'm gonna turn this down more. You have time to um, develop their hearts, warm their hearts. You know, you need to do that with yours first, but there are lots of really fun and wonderful ways to do that yourself. Again, I can't stress highly enough, strongly enough, well-educated heart. That web page, the app, the app is nice because it's really easy to use, really um, fairly intuitive. And that gives you lots of opportunities to feed your own heart, to fill your cup, like Kathy was talking about earlier, so that then you're available to your kids in a very different way, a much more fulfilling way. So um, any thoughts on that, on anything in that arena? As I try to see if I can bring my volume back on the computer and take it off my phone, because I think that'll help you guys. I have something to um, Great, say. Great, um, so I started taking the classes with Well-Educated Heart, like you recommended, which was amazing, and it's been amazing. Um, anyways, I had taken that class. Can you guys hear me okay? You can hear me, right? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I started taking, the, I took the Hillsdale class about children's literature a while ago, because I've just been like, I need to like, deepen my knowledge and um, pursue learning opportunities for myself. So I've been doing that. And then you mentioned that, I, I, it's just so funny. Like, I feel like Counseling Father's really been guiding me. But so I started taking those classes and we just, I just did the, the little thing that she talked about the Snow Queen. And it, it was so like cool to me have those, both of those perspectives. But I, something that really stuck out to me when you were reading it is that, the importance of family relationships like the Kay and Gerda had this bond and he, she was able to soften his heart in probably in a way I feel like that somebody else wouldn't have been able to do and I think that's one of the key things about you know like approaching children with art and culture and music and things that are help warm their hearts and, and the gospel that it helps them or the scriptures that helps them to have it's more enjoyable at least it's more enjoyable for me to like look at this cool thing and let's read this story like we've been reading this story with the kids and in this story there's two brothers that i'm reading it's barley and rise the name of it anyways but they have this bond and um it's cool to see um my children being able to see these examples and to be able to build a relationship with them and with each other that will help them, you know, later on in their lives when they're facing the snow queen or when they're, you know, having these other challenges, their sibling relationships and your relationship with them is going to make a huge difference if you're able to reach them when they're struggling or whatever else. That doesn't mean that you're the only one and that's always the case, but if you've had that built that foundation with them. So I just thought that was really interesting to, to consider that portion of the story as well. I love that. I love that comment. I love that idea. And I think that's um, a really important part of the story is making those connections with people, with our families and preparing our children so that they have that foundation for, like you said, when they do encounter the snow queen in their lives. Wonderful. Thanks, Ida. Anybody else? And I'm so proud of you for going and doing that. 
Because like I said, when my friends first told me about well-educated heart, I thought it sounded wonderful and I meant to get around to it and I never did. And then when I finally did, I was sorry I hadn't done it sooner. So. My sister actually mentioned this to me a couple years ago and she said it has a great library of books on it. And so I looked at the li library and I had the app on my phone and I was like, Oh yeah. And so then I've, I've been digging into it, but I, I mean, like, it's a little bit confusing how to navigate through, but I'm like, okay, I just went to the intro course, but I've been going through it and like, it's so awesome. So everyone should do yeah. it. You should do it. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you. And I think it's really interesting that um, many of us have had exposure to it, but we're maybe more focused on the um, temporal, the intellect, part of teaching our kids that we didn't open our hearts and let that in. So I think that's super interesting because obviously that's exactly what we're, what we're trying to change um, through those classes. And actually I agree with you when you first get in there, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Then once you take that introductory course and start on the mother's university, all of a sudden things start falling into place and making sense. So, so um, look forward to that. <laughs> so, okay, so just from my perspective, remember that the things I talk about, this is my perspective here. Um, we have had a date night once a week from the time that we, I think, you know, got married. But when our kids came along, that was very hard for me. When we were homeschooling, at the beginning of that, it was a little challenging for me. I felt like I didn't really have the time you know, I could use the time for planning or, you know, all kinds of things. And I decided, no, no, you need to make that a priority. So date night, if you were to, if you thought that sounded like a good idea and you were interested in that, looks different for every single couple. You know, it's whatever works for you, but it's making some time for the two of you to be together, to interact and to talk and really uh, not to complain about your week and everything that was hard in your week necessarily you can set aside another time for that with your spouse because obviously that's when you guys should be a team and you should be able to do that but date night should be a time where you get to remember that you are um a, a wonderful lovely woman and that you have this relationship with a with your spouse and that you're enjoying yourself um oh thank you very much got the list and um that you are an interesting and a whatever you however you see yourself you know whatever your relationship was you kind of go back to this feeling when you were dating and you get to go in you get to get kind of i did i have to kind of detox from being a mom because i'm trying to kind of change my role from mom to to wife or you know girlfriend or however i want to see myself that evening but so i kind of have a little bit of a of a of a time to I have the kids do a project or something I did in the earlier years and I would go upstairs and kind of get ready for date night and then we would go and it was wonderful it was really good for our relationship and um, when I got away from that and kind of did more of the just a rundown of my week and my frustrations and things like that I found that I wasn't I didn't feel renewed after that I just had this big dump session but I didn't feel better and I didn't get to have that escape you know of being that other person that I am seeing the other facet of me I guess I don't know but so then when I kind of got myself re got kind of back on the path again it was a good thing for me and it was a good thing for us you know there comes a day when your children do grow up and even if they don't leave your house right away they still have their own lives and they're doing their own things and then the two of you are back to spending time together. And if you haven't nurtured that relationship, there might not be a lot that you have going for, for that relationship. So um, I want to read the comment here. Christine, my husband and I are most on the same page and feeling good about our relationship when we make time to work in the shop together. It's a different type of date, but it's what works best for us. Great. That is wonderful. Um, in fact, my husband and I love to go out in the back part of our yard where our garden and trees and stuff are and work out there. We enjoy that. The kids think we're crazy, but we'd love to do that. And we're both, we like to work and we don't mind sweating out there. And so it's something we enjoy doing together. 
So anybody else, some other ideas of things that you have done with your spouse? If you are married, some might be single moms doing this. And if you are, man, props to you, because that's amazing. But if you are dating your husband or thinking of dating your husband, or you can't even imagine dating your husband because you don't want to, <laughs> any of those comments you can share. This is a safe environment. I'm looking, is anybody brave enough? Do you remember with your kids, Kate, hang on, just stay right there, don't, don't mute yourself. Do you remember, um, I don't know if you've read this, but I've read this, that it takes 30 seconds to process a question? No, but that makes sense. Super interesting, so when you ask your kids a question, or anybody for that matter, um, and come follow me, you know, Sundays or whatever, wait. Be prepared to wait, don't rush it, because if it takes us 30 seconds, and if you were to count 30 seconds from the time you ask a question, that's a long time. So 30 seconds to process the question, then they've gotta kinda of think of their answer, what it is they wanna share and say back to you. So give them that time to do that. It, I mean, it's the same with adults, I noticed that, and I need to remember not to jump in, but give you time. So Kate, you're on. Oh, well, I have two ways that I could go with that. Um, 30 seconds to process a question makes sense, though, because um, one of the things that, I, that the, I don't know, uh, protocol, and I don't know what it would be called, actually. But anyway, one of the things that I learned when I was um, serving a mission um, was in uh, Minnesota and South Carolina with the American Sign Language um, with the deaf people was that they, all people, but in general needed, if we were going to introduce a scripture to them, they needed to have some background to go with it. So what I kind of got into the habit of doing was I would ask the question first and then say, I'll, um, I'll present this in a minute. And, it, and so I would ask the question. So they already knew what I was preparing them for. And then I would give, um, tell them where the scripture was so that they could look it up and see it in English because they're doing, you know, two languages going on here. Right. And then, um, and then I would talk about the background of that scripture. Who's speaking? Who's he, he speaking to? <laughs> What's the history going on with that chapter? Which meant I needed to do my stuff before I presented it. <laughs> and then, um, and then we would read the scripture. The last step was to then re-ask the question and they were prepared to answer. But That's and you right. had some input, had some thoughts about that as well. So that makes sense to do it that way. So that uh, they're not getting ambushed, you know, here's the scripture, here's the, here's what happened. And, and now you tell me, now you teach me. Well, I just got introduced to it. How am I supposed to figure everything out from there? You know, no, you're right. You're right. And that's a great way to do that. I wrote that down because I need to do that. That's wonderful. I love it. Very helpful. And that gives them that time. Right. And it, it was two languages that we were dealing with, American Sign Language and English, because it was in the scripture form. And scriptures yeah. already is another language of its own, right? A different verbiage and, and such. So that was really helpful. So then, okay, so the other branch of my thought was, um, it was on date nights. I would love, does anyone have a list of cheap or free date nights? I don't know That's about you. That's a great you, idea. But financially, you know, things got tight this year and unexpected um, wage decreases going on and things like that. We could do some dates with, that cost some money, but we rarely ever prioritize for ourselves. And uh, financially, we don't, like if we're going to go on a date, we look at each other like, okay, but what's free or nearly free? And we just lose ideas. We just don't do anything <laughs> because we we don't have any great ideas. Um, there's always going out to eat, but my husband and I have um, very healthy diets and there's not a lot of healthy restaurants. So we're very limited. And then of course the healthy restaurants are also very expensive. So anyway, I would love if anyone knows of a date night list of ideas, things like that, maybe we could start trying that because um, our idea of date nights is pretty non-existent right now. <laughs> no, that's such a good idea. And that's something that we could put in the email. So if people want to send me their ideas or suggestions, then I can include that in next week's email. Because that would be great to have a list. 
Yeah. Yeah. Right now for the last few years, because we have been so tight date night consists of um, us going to fabulous places every Friday night, Costco. It's a blast. Um, Winco, if you haven't tried it, it is so much fun doing that together and Trader Joe's, <laughs> but, um, that's what we do. We can't afford to go out, but we go together and we talk and visit and let, you know, it's, it's, that's fun. Okay. Let's see. Christine again. Wonderful. We, Oh, and I, okay. Ida walks. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just going on a walk together. Oh my goodness. I love doing that with my husband. We talk so much while we're walking a picnic with healthy food. There you go. So you got your healthy food that you prepared and brought it. Um, we love a candle dinner after the kids go to bed. Awesome. Awesome. Such a good idea. We used to do that way back when, when we were going out and found the same thing, not the kind of meals that we wanted, you know, maybe not as healthy or whatever. So we'd go to the store and buy special ingredients we normally wouldn't buy and come home and make dinner together. My husband is a hobby woodworker. And so that's what we do in the shop. Oh, wonderful. You're making your kitchen table. How very cool is that? I love that. And games. Yes. Having a game night, going for a drive to a scenic area. Fabulous. Okay. Keep those coming. Um, also, you might want to remind your husband that your date night is for the two of you to connect, to, you know, kind of have that time together. Sometimes maybe, I don't know, maybe they're not getting the picture and the importance of that. Mine happens to love doing that, just wants that time to have just me and not everybody else. And so um, even though Fridays I am tired by the end of the day and really truly most of the time, maybe I'd like a nap. <laughs> maybe that's my idea of a good date night. Um, just you can go play with the kids and I'll just take a nap, you know. Um, check in with me later. But, um, but when I take the time to then refresh and go out with them and be the, the companion, you know, the spouse, I end up having a great time and I come back refreshed in a way that can only happen with that time together. So, okay. Oh yeah. I love this. Great ideas. Okay, any other comments about spouses, relationships? I do want to, to actually go a little, um, oh, hold on, let me see. Catch sunset from different locations, fabulous. Take fun pics with the sunset behind, absolutely. My goodness, sometimes we forget and we, we don't even have pictures of our, just us and our spouse, you know? Um, super cheesy, okay, super cheesy is good, but pre-pandemic, we would go to the bookstore, we would usually start with, um, book flirting using using the title to pay a compliment for example how cute that is so cute I love it I love that okay then Kate question do you choose the same day and time or go spontaneously there you go out of the habit so we need to restart and I like both options don't you think Kate, both, I mean, both would work. It would be lovely to remember that you could be spontaneous. You know, back in the day, that's what we all did, right? Oh, I love it. Okay. Um, also, remember, this is something that's coming real handy for me. Um, how do you want your spouse to look at you? Do you want them to be very aware of all of your shortcomings? Or would you like them to be a little bit more generous and to, you know, to be kind <laughs> and maybe forgiving of some of those. I think sometimes that's what we want from them, but that's not necessarily what we give to them. So it's good to remember that. And, and uh, you know, the whole golden rule thing works wonders. Kathy. Well, um, I was gonna say, sometimes it's hard for me to come out of the mom mode into the date mode. And um, sometimes I, it, it, say that to my husband he does not understand it he's been thinking about this yeah. or he, it's easier for him to transition yes. for some reason but for me I, I don't i come away not even refreshed from a date night because things didn't go well with the kids when we were gone or whatever and or i wasn't ready to enjoy myself and, and relax so i think as mothers we need to remember that's our responsibility to prepare ourselves to be a good date <laughs> or have fun or let ourselves and that might take a few hours <laughs> like, I don't know to get ready for that but yeah. if we don't then we're going to cheat ourselves out of that time and I'm talking to myself because <laughs> it's it's a hard thing to do 
and uh -huh. you know, so there's not enough time in the day to prepare. It feels like you just kind of go, or you go for the walk at night, and the first 25 minutes is like you just kind of dumping all of the stress of the day, and that's not super fun for him. But I think that um, it's important for him also to understand that that is an important part of our need as a, wim a woman to be able to be yeah. heard and understood and, and to, you know, recognize the things we've been doing. And so I don't know, it's a, it's a ebb and flow of the relationship, but we need to be honest with our husbands and with ourselves and make sure we prepare ourselves for what we want it to be like. So, and that can be, that can be really difficult to find time to do that. So. And no, that's that's, my statement, so. Oh, it's fabulous. That's so but good. And it's comment, important. I love the comment. So. Well, so I was thinking as you were talking, I thought, you know, we had to go, there was a learning curve. And I think the reason we did it Friday nights is because we got kind of a rhythm going and our family knew what it was, how it was going to be. So either with babysitters or with your own kids watching your children, if you get to go out, out, um, or even if you stayed home and this would be your husband, I mean, what I finally was able to help my husband understand the idea that I had to detox kind of, and I needed to change hats. And because I'm not a man, I can't um, compartmentalize like they do. So I can't go from being mom to, you know, sexy hot mama, you know, in like two seconds, that's not going to happen. I can't do it. And so I, he was working from home at the time. And so he would take the kids. I just said, give me an hour before we leave. You take the kids, they, you get everything ready for them, whether that's getting ready for the babysitter, go pick up the babysitter with the kids, get dinner for them, whatever was going to happen, however that evening was going to go or put them to bed. You know, if we were just doing a date night at home, he had that job because if he wanted me to be uh and you know all on all in uh is you know spouse wife lover you know on the date night right then i needed that time to transition and so once he understood that he was i mean he was all on board you know like how much time do you need you know what <laughs> whatever you need i will provide it so that you can be there with me on date night you know and so that worked for us that was helpful but that took a lot of conversations to be able to help him understand that and then uh, we had to make a compromise and we had to have some on um fast sunday we do um what do we call them lindsay what do we call them on fast Nut sunday with dad we have interviews you know daddy whatever what do you call them why can't I think of this right now? But anyway, we have a one-on-one -on -one interview, dad with the child, one at a time on fast Sundays. Dad's fasting, so he's more receptive to the spirit, you know, and we just have these, it's when we've always done this. Well, my, I get one too. And so that's kind of my time guaranteed built into the month where I get to unload all of it. And then if I need a blessing, I can get a blessing. If I need counsel, we need to make some new decisions, switch some things, change some things. That's when that happens. So it is built into our schedule. So then date nights are, it's a little bit easier for me to not unload there and, and just be able to be present. Does that make sense? But it was a transition and I had to help him understand. I think it can be kind of uh, more difficult for homeschooling moms because we carry this load all day long. And um, some, I, I was talking to my husband this morning saying, you know, when moms who send their kids to school, send them to school, they have like a celebration, woo! And there's two ways to look at that. You know, I sometimes feel like, oh, that's sad that they don't want their kids around. But at the same time, I totally understand that they're celebrating their, mo their me time, like their time to think through a thought completely or to clean up or do a project or whatever, or just to have some quiet in the house. And so um, I think that it's unique to, homeschooling moms that we can get overwhelmed with so much on us all the time and so it with with a spouse with your husband it has to be understood that that is a definitely a heavier burden than a lot of moms may carry yeah. um because there isn't that break and i tell my husband all the time you had a break from the little noises and the <laughs> little pecking hens you know all day long when you're on your drive to work or back from or whatever, you've had a little, I need a little, like you said, a, a break between to change hats, to, to kind of mm -hmm. 
get my mind in the right place. But um, that's that's interesting. That I just it just occurred to me that maybe homeschool moms carry a heavier heavier burden with that because they don't Absolutely. have that time without right. their kids. Right. Well, you're so. 24 seven, 24 seven. You have to remember that and you have to give yourself a huge, a, a huge break. Yeah. Um, remembering that, you know, show yourself grace. Also, you can call a principal um, administrator, you know, counselor meeting anytime you want and you bring that principal in there and sit him down and you tell him, <laughs> this is not working. <laughs> and I need some help. I need some advice. I need some counsel. I need some direction. I need some more money. I mean, why don't whatever it is you have that conversation with your principal anytime that you, you know, need to schedule that. So don't forget that. I also call in substitute teachers. I call in yes. substitute and put on wild crats or something like that. <laughs> I need exactly. And That's I say, exactly okay, we're watching right. Little Women today, you know, or whatever yep. I'm going to do. But because sometimes mom needs to recharge, you know, so. Yeah. 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 And like yeah. you said, especially homeschool moms. So if you're feeling that burden, you have lots and lots of reasons for that burden. You know, reason one is your first child, reason two is your second child, your third child, you know, and then all the subjects you teach and all the things you've got going and your husband, you know, all these things are reasons you have to need a giant break. So, so don't forget about that. Make sure that like Kathy said in the beginning, that you make that time to have time for yourself to prepare. And if your kids, even if they're watching television, oh my goodness, heaven forbid, you know, while you get up and get yourself together in the morning, whatever it is you need to do so that you feel like, okay, I am not starting this, you know, running five laps behind. That's a huge benefit to you. So anyway, um, I'm looking, oh yeah, give yourself time to change hats. Honestly, remember that. You just can't switch it on and off like that. You're a woman, you're not a man. You don't compartmentalize, you know, we do it all of it all the time all the layers everything <laughs> so anyway show yourself some grace there okay any other comments on the husband dating realm looking to see anybody else this is so weird i'm so sorry that it didn't work out today with the nor everything being normal i don't know how this recording is going to work out either but we'll see um, okay, on to a side thing. Um, husband as a participant and supporter of homeschool. If you're new to homeschooling, please know that it is not unusual for your husband to be on board today and not on board tomorrow or not on board for years and questioning you all the time and wondering what are you talking about? Are you nuts? Our kids are going to be so weird or you know, they're not, are they learning this? Have they done this yet? Have they done that? What about this? Here, honey, here's a checklist from the state. Here's all the state standards. That's what I used to get. <laughs> oh, oh, honey, thanks so much. I'll just put this over here <laughs> into the trash, you know, because I didn't care about what the state standards were, but, but he was in his way trying to be helpful. Just know that it, sometimes it takes a while for them to be on board. Generally, they do get on board once they have seen their children and they see after a while they see the benefits of this wonderful thing of educating your children at home and then the craziest thing happens and you overhear them having a conversation with somebody telling it, telling them about how you homeschool your kids and how awesome it is and they're going into all this detail and they know stuff that you didn't even realize they were paying attention to and it's awesome and you feel completely validated i mean yeah so it's eight years of non-validation and you know five minutes of validation but gosh moms will take anything they can get right so a little goes a long way in that um so any comments on that any stories to share about that maybe if you're driving with your husband you can't share that story i don't know <laughs> Okay, that, this comment is wonderful. I tell you, if you start discussing it before the kids come along, oh yeah, if you're in that camp, that's awesome. That gives you a huge head start, <laughs> absolutely. Gosh, and then for these moms who have jumped in just because they have no other alternative because they don't like what's going on with the schools, you know, or whatever. 
So one of our moms that's on right now, I was just teasing her, giving her a hard time, but she's driving with her family. They are up north. That's Lindsay. And her husband, David, has been so incredible. It's so much fun to hear him as he's talking about the kids. Hi, David. And what they're doing. But man, he is on board. And these kids have wonderful adventures, just having normal family outings but having dad be a participant and being a big participant really just, um, and it's, it's nothing that he's having to script or schedule or whatever. It's just him being himself and being part of his kid's life. And I love seeing that. I love watching that. I know I gave major props to Rob last time because I love seeing what they do, their family and what Rob and Kathy do as they're traveling and have all these adventures with their kids. And as Rob is doing, um, working with the kids, teaching them about entrepreneurship. You know, that's so cool. Um, so dads can be involved in such a wonderful way and be so supportive, just being a great dad. So I love seeing that. So I love that you're just, you're in the middle of an adventure, Lindsay, and you guys are on, that's really cool. Um, and their kids, like they do, uh, uh, Ida was talking last week. You guys missed it. We had two moms come on last week after the meeting as we were just getting ready to close and they had forgotten and logged in and we went like for another hour and 45 minutes <laughs> just having these awesome discussions. But Ida is one of those and her kids had been out back all morning long building themselves, building a, bl a hunting blind. <laughs> I thought that was so cool. I love that. And Lindsay, one of her kids came to my house, well, they come to my house sometimes and they play in the, what we call the outback where we have our garden and trees and stuff like that. And out there I have two sawhorses that somebody made into cows. You know, they put little necks, heads, necks on them, whatever. And they have just been in my backyard forever and they were kind of thrashed. And so Max took one of them home and he took on the project of restoring it. And so his dad, being supportive dad, sh showed him how to use the tools. And then just Max just went at it and he completely restored one of my cows and he's got the other one right now. I think that's so cool that our kids have those opportunities to be able to pursue something that they love, something that they have an interest in or a passion about and can just go for it. But when dad gets involved, even just as that uh, the facilitator, that's really the best way to do it anyway. But it's awesome. I love it. Okay, any moms have anything to share about dads, dad involvement, dad on board, off board? Anything, just making sure. Any dads want to share how awesome it is to homeschool their kids? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, okay, so the dads never want to be on. That's like such a weird thing. Um, Stephen never wanted to be a part of that. He was just like, I do my job. <laughs> I'm good. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to my other topic, which I did out of order, but social media addiction. Oh, yeah. No, Kathy, oh, go sorry. ahead. Go for it. No. After our last meeting when Rob was on that time, a couple times ago, whatever, yeah. he was so funny. He was like, I think I could do a dad Zoom meeting. And I'm like, okay, you totally go for could. It, babe. <laughs> That's awesome. He would be but awesome. <laughs> He's like, who would ever come? Would the other dads want to? Yeah. So ask your husbands and then message me and let me know if they'd want to be on a dad, homeschooling dad Zoom meeting. I'm not sure they would know what to talk about, actually. <laughs> so, I know, and it would be about 20 minutes long, probably. <laughs> yeah, there'd be no niceties. There'd be no, how right. are you doing what? No, it'd just be, here's the, here's the deal. Um, but he is not opposed to the idea. So check with your husbands and see, because sometimes dads need to know that other dads mm -hmm. are okay with this. And um, that has helped my husband to know that other dads are not thinking this is nuts. So let me know, send me a message. I'm the one that's been messaging everybody all the reminders yeah. on, on Messenger. So that's who you would respond to and tell me. But and then I'll let him know and he'll just do something real casual and he'll figure it out when, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's really a whole game changer when dad's on board, the pressure is off mom and he takes on some of the responsibility himself. I know, is Lupe still on here? Lupe, are you on here still? I didn't notice, but anyway, she, 
I know her and her husband, and I've seen pictures of them together doing some activities. So I know he's been a little bit more involved also, but maybe. Um, yeah, she's still here. So she must be with the kids or something. Anyway, mm -hmm. but um, it's great. It's great when they can get on. And, but a lot of dads are super busy. I totally get that. And they hardly have any time at home to be with the kids. So um, do your best. Sometimes it's just, we let the kids, I, I had the kids show their dad at the end of the day, what they did, something to show off so that yep. he, can, he can see natural progress without asking me what they're doing. And then it kind of calms his fears that they are progressing or they've learned something or did something. Since we're not super structured, that kind of helps. So um, anyway, just my two cents, but the dads, they'll, they'll survive, but you need to kind of hold their hand a little bit through it all. So <laughs> it kind of can be, they're not the ones usually on the front line with the kids. So it, they need a little reassurance. Awesome. I love this. And you've already got one dad that's, that's in, I think Kate's awesome. husband too, right? So Natalie's husband, that's wonderful. Good job, dad. That's impressive when they, their hearts are open and they're willing to get involved. It's so great because gosh, you know, you already have to prove yourself to so many people, you know, mother-in-laws yeah. or moms or neighbors or visiting teachers or, you know, whoever, there are already a lot of people in your life that you're feeling the pressure and you feel like you've got to, um, oh, okay, that's funny. Like you've got to show them that your kids are learning, you know, that they're doing the right stuff and you do not need to do that with your husband too. I mean, the pressure of that. So I should rephrase that. You do need to show him so that he gets on board, but it just feels like it, you have so much more pressure when you're still in that stage where you're having to prove to your husband that what you guys are doing is the right thing. Once you're past that, oh my goodness, it really relieves a lot of the stress. So be prayerful about that too. Um, I'm going to see what Kate said. My husband is supportive, but not often involved except for mom's time, time out. He's appreciative knowing other dad's ideas of support here. Yeah. Awesome. Wonderful. Gosh, you guys, this is fabulous. But be, if your husband's not hundred percent there yet, just take it to heavenly father and just tell him you'd really love it. If dad were hundred percent on board, what can you do? Don't be, you know, nagging him and bugging him about it. You go the right channels and things are going to work out a lot better. Find out what you need to do to help support him. What would be the best way to get him to have him feel supported and him feel positive about it so that he's on board. Cause that's just going to take away a whole level of stress for you. Um, oh, very cool. Lupe. That's awesome. Um, this is great. You guys have great support system. Wonderful. Okay. Anybody else, anyone else want to share something at this point before we go on? Just making sure, and you know, you can always jump in on a, a previous subject anytime. I'm not gonna, it's not like, okay, break. We're going on and we're never going back. Um, everything's open. Um, okay. So on to social media addiction. Anybody feeling that these days? with everything that's going on in the world, or did you? Some of us did. I was one of those really silly. I got myself just sucked in um, to what was going on, feeling like I was making a difference somehow when I was gonna save my country, right? We are going to have one of these Friday Zoom meetings. Um, Kate is, has agreed to be one of our hosts for that to discuss the freedoms. She's ta we talked about the fact that she would be okay with participating. So I'm taking that and running with it, Kate. <laughs> That's all I needed was a head nod and I'm good to go. Um, but we'll talk about that. We'll talk about our country and the freedoms that we're feeling like we need to defend now and what we as moms can do. So Kate and I will talk about when would be a comfortable time to do that. And then we'll post that, but that's coming up. Um, and if any of you other moms feel like this is your topic and you want to, to be involved, then, um, then yes. Um, hang on one sec. Oh, awesome. Another, and Ida too. Wonderful. Gosh, we've got great supportive dads. Good job, you guys. Um, so back onto this social media thing, just know if you are on social media and you're kind of freaking out because of everything that's going on, um, or if you're going back and forth between, I'm reading my scriptures, 
gosh, the world is wonderful. Aren't we so loved? Heavenly Father's got all of this under control and we're going to be just fine and we can feel confident and we can feel um, at peace. And then you go, you know, scrolling and oh my gosh, I can't believe people are doing this and oh, this is horrible and oh my gosh, and what am I going to do when I've got to get out there and I've got to fix things, you know? That cycle is something that Satan loves to have you get on, loves to you, for you to be doing that. So that discouragement can be part of your day and part of your life. And so tiny little, little plug for unplugging. Um, I have to be on for some of this stuff to connect with people. But um, even in discussing whether I wanted to have a Facebook page for this, I thought I can't do it because it'll be, I'll get too involved and I'll be on Facebook too much and I don't want to do that. I never had a problem with social media until March. Never. And I got sucked in and I would stay up till really like late, late at night to be on top of what was going on, you know. And I have since taken that out of my life on the advice of one of my daughters, <laughs> as she and I were talking about it and she'd had a similar exper experience. Um, and oh my goodness, I'm back to the calm and the peace and the balance and it's really nice. So there is definitely a place for social media and wonderful things that can happen because of it. And if you have a social media platform and you're active on it, then fabulous, because I'm sure you're there to do good. And that's, that's so great and the world needs that. Just be careful. Just know that that's a way that Satan knows he can get into our hearts, at least he could with mine. And I was shocked at the difference that made in my life, what I felt and um, the calm and peace that I feel now. And uh, it's a much better balance. Um, going to a comment, because it's really important. Um, has anyone ever had a spouse unemployed while homeschooling? Did you quit homeschool? Okay, me. Um, and it's, the question goes on, quit because you needed to go back to work while he found something or, you know. So just to answer that first question, yeah, um, twice. Um, twice we've been unemployed during this time and uh, we just took it to the Lord and asked what do we do do we do something differently for us it was not for me to go to work and to stay home and continue teaching the children that that was a priority that that has made for some very tough extremely tight situations lots of learning lots of blessings um, but we continue to homeschool through it. That's what we were instructed by Heavenly Father to do. If that is your situation right now, go to him. That's really the best source. So there are lots of creative ways that you can work around um, any kind of work situations where work or lack of work gets in your way. Um, if it's what Heavenly Father wants your family to continue doing, he will help you figure out the way to do that. Does that help at all? I hope that helps. That's been a little shaky for us multiple times, but um, we were blessed to be able to keep moving forward. Okay. Anything else on that? Um, oh yeah, in the poverty bracket. Oh yeah, that's super fun. Except for library fines, we didn't buy any curriculum. <laughs> yeah, I always say I supported my public library. Um, for the first four years of homeschooling. Yeah, with grades under fifth, I prayed for resources and found people who were donating curriculum. Thank you for bringing that up, Kate, because that's what I found too. I would be wondering where, what I was gonna do, where I was gonna get what I needed for my kids. And I would go to the Heavenly Father and pray and say, okay, this is where we are and what do I need to do? And I would just have a prompting, uh, check out the garage sales. You know? And I would check out the garage sales. Now it's everything for you guys is, you know, offer up or Craigslist online or whatever. But for me, it was yard sales. And so I would just, I'd go through the listing and I'd feel like, okay, that one and that one. And I would go to those yard sales and I would find school materials, homeschool materials or rich, amazing, wonderful books to add to my library, whatever it was. And I would even, you know, I'd feel that, oh, you know, get that one, pick that one up. Or, you know, I'd pick up something and be going through it and just feel like, yeah, there's something about that, you know, and I'd take that home and it would be what we needed. So the Lord will provide that, you know, faith is really a powerful 
thing in our lives if we let it be. That principle of exercising faith and believing that Heavenly Father really will provide you with the things that you need. You know, and that's an important distinction too. You might think you need this thing and Heavenly Father knows, well, no, actually this right here, this is your little treasure and your gold mine. And this is what's going to be the thing that, that is a blessing for your family. And he'll provide that for you. Um, yeah. And people donating curriculum, that happens. It really happens all the time. So just exercise the faith, open your eyes to receive the blessing and it will, you know, it'll come. I promise you it will come. That's always been my experience. And I hear that from multiple other homeschoolers. Okay. So now going to um, a thing about learning that I wanted to share with you for you as you're, as you're learning to use more basic methods with your homeschooling as especially if you guys that are you moms that are new and not knowing where to start and you need some time this will give you time you tell stories to your kids and you wonder how the heck does that make how is that homeschooling um how is that going to work for us and i'm going to put that on hold because i want to address this really quickly christine my husband got word that his contract wouldn't be renewed Two weeks later, the shutdown happened. He had his job till June 30th, and while he was trying to find a new job, it was so stressful. I found we backed off school and did more hands-on stuff. It was mostly for me. I needed physical labor to help my mind not go crazy. Totally understand that. Thankfully, we were never without a job, and during that more physical three to four months, didn't set my kids back, right? Breaks aren't the end of the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I can support that 100%. Um, Megan Norp, who talked with us a couple of weeks ago, she's got that down. She understands that they um, unschool their kids. And that really happened because they had a time period when they weren't really doing homeschool. They had so many things going on and they weren't getting around to what they thought they should. And then they had to put their kids in public school after that huge time of kind of being down, not doing school. Our kids did great. Um, and she learned, wow, we actually accomplish a lot of learning when I don't see any formally form formal learning taking place. And now they're they've been unschooling unschooling now for years and have learned that that really is a wonderful way for your kids to learn. So um, on that, I'm going to talk a little bit about how this what will seem to you probably like unschooling, how it works for your kids, the benefits that come, just, just a couple things. Um, and then I'll add another one next week and the next week, but um, layer the learning of your children, layer their learning, um, add details one at a time. You want your kids to learn a thing at a very basic level, they learn a thing, then they apply the thing in their lives, in their little world, um, and then they uh, enlarge their experience with that thing on their own. They'll follow that up. Okay, so you add details one at a time, and those details then can last a lifetime for them. Um, so this idea of the arts, using the arts in your homeschool, so music, storytelling, pictures, uh, poetry, all of these things, using those things in your learning give you what you're doing is you're helping your children i've made i've made notes and i shouldn't because it gets me kind of distracted i don't want to forget anything but at the same time i feel like i'm reading and i don't like that but using the arts in your learning with your children gives your children and this is what marlene says eyes to see ears to hear and i can't remember and heart to feel that duh of course, that's what it is. Eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to feel. And that's what you want to give your kids. They, um, the, those kinds of things, the arts, the music, the poetry, the storytelling, um, the pictures, those are the things that light up the desires in our hearts. That's how you light up desire in your children's hearts. And the thing is <laughs> that every single one of our actions, you as a parent, you as an adult, all of our actions are based on our desires. My husband's favorite phrase is we do what we want to do. Every single person on the planet does what they want to do. Um, and sometimes you don't see that and you don't realize that at first, but if you really sit back and with an open mind, explore that, you realize that is true. We do what we desire. 
So what you want to do is plant all these rich, wonderful things in your children's hearts so that what they desire, which is what they're going to do, comes from this wonderful, rich, uh, well-fed place. So for example, if you are using this way of teaching your children and you have that foundation, that art, music, storytelling, um, poetry, all of that, that's what you're using. You've got this depth of learning that doesn't happen any other way. It doesn't happen with the academics. It just doesn't. And we've discussed that before about our experiences as moms when we were in school, about the memorizing facts and, and figures and all of that, and how our learning stays at this very kind of ground level right here. That's where our learning is. But if we take a subject and we, uh, we approach it from this heart way of learning, it can be history or science or math or anything, but we've got this, we're telling stories and we're talking about it in a rich way or we're listening to music or we're um, looking at the art in person or you know, opening our little books and talking about it and experiencing this, then we create that depth of learning and the children, um, it goes into their hearts in a way that's very different than the other approach to learning. And it's much, much more effective. Um, and they're learning through context. Um, they are learning through the things that you're doing together. So as you are reading a story to them, I think I wrote this down so I could see it better. But when you are, uh reading a story to them aloud and this is so easy to do as a mama or putting it on even audible but just sitting there with them as you're listening to this story very naturally these things happen and so very naturally your children learn a sense of writing because you they experience a beginning a climax and an end to a story they don't know that's happening. You're not thinking about the fact that that's happening, but that is happening every time they hear another story. Oh, there's this beginning. And then there's that climax, all the stuff that happens in the middle, and then it resolves and there's an end point. And so through that, they learn about a you know, sense of writing and how you would put together a story, how they would write something something and tell something. Um, you are also enlarging their capacity to create images from the words. That's huge. And I love it when you're telling them a story that doesn't have pictures. I mean, I'm all about picture books. I absolutely love them. But I started using Bill Bennett's um, Book of Virtues that we talked about last week and just sitting in the hallway on a chair and outside all my kids' bedroom doors and then reading to them. Um, or being, you know, in their room sitting on the floor and reading out of this book that has no pictures. There's great value in that because they create the pictures in their heads. So they, they make up this whole story in their heads while they're listening to the pictures. They are able to create images from the words. There are a lot of people that don't know how to do that right now, adults that don't have that as part of their lives and in their hearts. Also, another thing is the music in your voice adds a layer of understanding to them. You have heard a story writ read, or even if you've like, clicked on some of those audible links and it's the computer voice, you know, and the computer is just telling you the story in that monotone voice, you know, and I can't do it. As much as I want to listen to that story, I cannot do it. Because there's no, there's no life to the story. And I love to tell stories because I like to put the life in the stories. I keep looking up there, to you guys up there, and I know the camera's right here, sorry, I'm just a dork and I don't know how to do that right, but anyway, that layer of, um, of listening that that adds is huge for that to be that music part of your voice, how fun, Kathy gets to see her nephews, how cute is that? Um, but that's important and that's another part of it and that's something they're learning as you are just telling them a story, you're just reading a story or telling a story from your life, or making up a story. My kids' favorite bedtime stories, and they still remember some of them, I told them they ought to write them down, are stories that their dad would make up at bedtime. They, he would go in for story time some nights, and he would never read a story, that was not his thing, but he would make up a story. And so he would make us up a story, and the main characters would be, um, you know, cricket, or frogs, or, you know, Aunt Betty and the hula hoop. I mean, whatever, I, you know, something goofy and completely made up. And my kids would love that and they would eat it up. The only problem is, is then they would ask later for that story, you know, oh, tell me the one about, <laughs> like, 
<laughs> and then they would tell him back the story that he had told to them that night. Fabulous. Great. That's so good for them because they're learning, they're listening, all those different levels that I you know, mentioned, that is happening to them while those stories are being told. Okay, I'm going to my notes because I know you guys are talking a little bit about this. Okay, Ida, I love that about the Snow Queen story, the idea that when the Snow Queen took him away, all he could remember, yes, was his multiplication tables. I sit in the hall after they are all in bed and read a story. They loved it and would beg me to read to them. Yes, yes, yes. And then her husband would do the same thing. I used to tell him to read a, story, a real story. And then I had to bite my tongue because I realized that it was a really great experience for them. Right, exactly. Like I think, no, 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 I've got this great story and it's the one that I wanted them to hear next, you know? And he'd say, no, no, I'm just gonna do my thing. And then I'm, I'm so grateful that he did. Now, Kathy, Rob would include a value or an issue into his story that we had discussed that the kids needed to hear. Yes, yes, so many ideas. Yeah, but you know, family home evening too. Family home evening for us has always been about addressing things that were going on in our family, but in a way that the kids never knew that that's what we were doing. You know, we would bring in stories or whatever to give you them good examples. Okay, the Eminem song at our house totally made up and they ask for it all the time. Awesome. I love it. I think we really, we work too hard as homeschool moms trying to do something that looks pretty. It's in a pretty package and it's all organized and we have our planners and all this. There's nothing wrong with that again, remember, but we focus on that so much when really just hanging out with our kids and telling them stories and laughing and playing with them will honestly give them a rich and wonderful childhood. And when you get to middle school, high school, you can throw in some of the real books and things that they need to support their interests, their passions, their drives, and they will be fine. I promise it's super interesting right now that ACTs and SATs aren't being required for the next couple of years in colleges because they can't, because kids couldn't take them. And colleges are going to see, oh, we don't need those. Also, side, -ish, side little point here, my daughter Sarah was talking with a group of high school kids and their moms the other day, they came over, and um, Sarah was saying that you will find very, really interesting when you go to apply to colleges, and even her for grad school, uh, there's a whole separate thing to click if you're a homeschooling student on a lot of these, not on all of them, they're not going to all be the same, but, and then they'll just say, contact us. We love homeschool students. They're good learners, good independent learners, you know, and they went on about that. Fabulous. That's wonderful. So these moms or you moms, I don't know if any of you are in this group, but that are sweating, you know, I've got to have the transcripts. I've got to have everything down here and I've got to have it all. Uh, well, one of my kids had transcripts my first one because I did the same thing Ugh, you know and I created a transcript and and he used it and it worked and everything but the next two we didn't have transcripts I didn't have the number of hours that they needed to have in high school to have been able to have a transcript all filled out and they went to college and succeeded in college and are doing really well and so there's just a lot of that you don't have to sweat because they get so much through this warm, wonderful family environment, this environment of learning where you're learning just through natural experiences, where they're getting to um, pursue their own interests and passions. And then you supplement with the things that you know your children need in their, for their education. And all that stuff can be given to you by Heavenly Father, I promise. He'll tell you what you need, what each one of them needs. He'll help you to get the supplies that you need for that, all of that. If you want to do math and science and those things in your class and you want to start with your kids and you want to start it early, do it. If that's your passion and you want to share that with your kids, do it. I'm not tell, suggesting that you don't do those things. I'm just trying to let you know that you can breathe, that you can sit back a little bit, think about it, pray about it. In the meantime, just hang out with your kids and you'll... I think you'll end up giving yourself some um, slack 
um, and, and showing yourself some mercy and you might have a lot looser schedule than you originally anticipated. Um, going back to see what Kate added. Um, oh, fun. My husband will be teaching the art, so it's not all on me. Lucky mom. That's awesome. I'm excited because he sees, he does things so differently than often in my head, not the correct way. But I'm learning to shut my mouth because it all works out. And it's a new teacher and a new method for my kids. Awesome. That's wonderful. That's good that you're being open to that. So many times, something new and different, you know, and that's not our way, what we had in our minds, you know, we reject. So good for you. Okay, more comments on this idea, this way of teaching your kids, on giving yourself some grace, showing yourself some grace. I feel you totally. I'm getting better about shutting my mouth when my husband helps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could have learned that earlier. That would have been good. Um, okay, in this reading, using the arts for your kids, you are expanding their mind for future learning. You really are. You're opening that up. And as well as building character, igniting curiosity, and planting ideas. If somebody said, okay, moms, I've got this method for you. And this is surefire. It's going to work. Um, I can tell you how you can build character in your kids. How you can completely ignite curiosity and they'll be on fire. And they'll be, you know, so curious about so many things. They'll be out there on their own trying to learn about them. And you're going to be planting beautiful, good, wholesome ideas in their minds. Do you, would you like to know what that is? Would you like to do that in your homeschool? You know, I would have said yes. I would have said please. And I would have been ready with my notebook, you know, to make, to write down all these things that I was going to have to do to ensure that that was what I was going to get with my kids. And then for somebody to say, okay, sit down with them and read a story to them. Show them up some beautiful, beautiful artwork. Listen to beautiful music together. Um, have them memorize a poem. Wouldn't that be fun? Do that together. And then I'm waiting. Okay, yep, I can do all that stuff. We can do that. That'll be kind of our extra credit stuff. Okay, now, what do I need to do? <laughs> I'd be waiting for the, you know, what's the big thing? What's the program? Where's the pretty box with all of the books in it and all lined up, you know, or all lined up on my shelf or whatever. Where is that? Because I want to know what that is because I'm going to do that with my kids. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. Okay, tell me. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's really all you need to do to start with with your kids. Even if your kids are big, they still need that. They still need their hearts to be warmed. That quote that comes from that wonderful TED Talk um, by Gordon Newfield, I think that's his name, you cannot teach a child whose heart you do not have. If you're older ones, if you don't have their hearts and you're needing to get that back, it's the arts. That's the best way to do that. And are they gonna roll their eyes? Yeah, probably. It's probably what they're gonna do when you start with them. That's okay. You can handle that. It's not like you haven't seen it before. And so you start reading them stories and spending that time with them. Ida, go. Oh, sorry. No, no, I, no I, it's great. I just listened to that and I loved it so much. And I was like, it, it just so struck me so hard about, um, like you talked about kids. If, if first thing in the morning, if you try to like, get up, come on, let's go, hurry, hurry, hurry. You know, the first thing they want to do is slow down. And I was like, that is so true. <laughs> but, but I was like really thinking about that, conscious of that. And just the last couple of days since I listened to it, just like two days ago or something, and instead of doing the, come on, hurry up, hurry up, I was trying really hard to say, hi, you know, what's going on? You know, do you need a hug? And like, we were going to church on Sunday and my youngest was having a fit and I was just, he kept like being just, you know, a little tyrant and he's, he's three, three years old. Anyways, I just stopped and I was like, okay, I'm going to do something different. And I gave him a hug and I was like, what's the matter? What's going on? Do you need to talk to mom? You want a hug or something? And at first he was like, what are you doing? <laughs> this is not my mom. What have you done with her? Yeah. <laughs> and, and then it totally changed his mood. And I've noticed that that's really huge. I've noticed that with all my kids, like I've had those kinds of experiences where I just had a moment, like it was a, a moment of inspiration. My oldest son, one time, he's really like, 
quiet and very, um, he's very, he keeps his emotions inside and he was just being awful. And I was like, seriously, Parley, you know, just what is going on? And I didn't know what to say. And then I was like, do you need a hug? <laughs> And he just starts crying and he said, yes. And I was, and I just started bawling and I was just like, gave him a big hug. And I was thinking, oh man, what, you know, what am I doing that I need to be paying attention to what's going on inside their hearts, you know, and feeding that first. So that was just like, yes, right. Do you want to, can I cram that into my head so that it stays yeah. there Don't and forget. doesn't come out? Yes. Exactly. I love it. Ida, thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. There's a thing that I, you know, too, I wish I'd learned earlier with my kids, but now I know and have with other kids, with other people's kids. Um, I, like I've said this before, I love children more than I love adults. I can't help it. I just, they're my favorite. And they're so much fun to be with. And I, I would choose, I'm sorry, don't take this personally, but I would choose to hang out with your kids rather than hang out with all of you if I were given that option. <laughs> I think that would be a blast. I would love it. Because they're honest, they're sincere, they're funny. You know, it's just a whole different thing. And I absolutely love spending time with kids. But you know, with my own, I was the drill sergeant in the beginning. You know, I, and I was loving mom and kind and everything, but when we had to get stuff done, I was like, hey, you know, snapping my fingers is a normal thing. And my kids, you know, if they hear that, they turn, they come, they're, they're right on. And we could be in a crowd or whatever. And I'm like this, and they, mom, my kids, wherever they are, are like, okay, that's very helpful. <laughs> I'm not saying don't do that because that came in handy. But I forgot sometimes to take it slowly. I forgot to go at their pace. I forgot to be warm. And my, for my invitations to come to the next thing we're doing to be a warm and friendly invitation rather than a command. Now, if I want to reach their hearts, if I want to um, really, really have them come along with me on this journey, I need to extend a warm um, invitation. So um, thank you for putting that on there, Ida. That's awesome. And that link to that TED Talk, that Gordon Newfield TED Talk is is in well-educated heart, but you know, it's, it's embedded in, in her stuff, but it's Gordon Newfield, N-E-U-F-I-E-L-D. And it is, I, I know it says you can't teach a child whose heart you don't have something like that, but I don't know what the title is. And I think that sweet Ida is looking that up for us. Um, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, anyway, it's a great, great link. Um, so, so here, this thing with children, this warm invitation. The reason I changed how I did things, and I didn't always do it because I'd done the other for so long, but I was, I gave myself a pat on the back every time I remembered to be more warm with my children in those invitations and interactions was I read something one time that was talking about children. Imagine being a child. So I'm gonna ask you guys to go through this with me. So imagine being a child going through um you're out in public like at a farmer's market i know we can't even do these things anymore so but anyway so you're out at a farmer's market in the olden days in the good old days you know um and we're walking with our parents and it's crowded you know because everybody wants to be out there everybody's at the different booths looking to see what they've got all that great produce that's out there and the beautiful things and so you're walking around with mom and dad and your little to your little toddler young child and you're walking along through the crowd. Now picture being that child. So you're, you're the child, you're the little person in that crowd and everybody else is up here and they're milling around and they're looking and they can see all the cool things that are on the, on the, out in the stalls and they can see the people and they can see what's going on and they can see where you're headed and they can see everything that's going on, but you can't. Cause you're, not only are you short down here, but you've got all these people's legs and bottoms and <laughs> purses and bags and whatever and kids feet, you know, that they're from the parents that are holding their kids hanging in your face. So you can't see that stuff. So you're just going along and, you know, maybe you're out there and you're seeing something really cool over there on the ground, you know, or something, or you're seeing these shoes that light up over there and that's super cool or whatever it is that you, that child is seeing. And your parents got your hand, so you've got your arm up like this, which probably isn't super comfortable to do that for very long. 
So wherever you are, do that. Just put your hand up there like your mom's got your hand, right? Don't be afraid. Come on, do it. There you go. All right, so you got your hand up there and you're walking along like that. And you're, you know, you're kind of like, uh, you know, they start tugging on your hand. And as a parent, you're like, you have no idea. I am keeping you safe. You know, what are you doing? Come on, come on, we got to go or whatever. Or they're, they're kind of, they're distracted by that thing they saw over there. So they kind of go this way and you, you know, kind of jerk them back maybe. And they're still like, uh, and they can't see and they don't know what's going on. They don't know why this is so cool or where you're going or what you're doing or why they're there. And, and that little experience, you know, me getting into that thing that I read changed how I saw children and changed how I saw my children. I started looking more from their perspective. So a good exercise for you with your children is at a, a few times during this next week, sit as a, an observer and just watch something that happens and try to watch it from your child's point of view. It's been fascinating for me to learn from my older grown up kids now, the things that they thought were happening when they were younger, things that they thought they understood, you know, and didn't. And as they explained to me, I think, what? How could you have even thought that? That's crazy. I had no idea you thought that. And I wish I could think of a good example. And of course I can't, but, um, but it was, it's just nuts sometimes, their perspective. Like there are times when maybe you get them in trouble, they were not doing anything wrong, not at all. I mean, it might've made your life a little more difficult, but from their perspective, they had a reason for what they were doing and they had a purpose, you know, or something and, and you just didn't see it. You didn't understand. Have you ever corrected your children? Like maybe they were, something was going on and there was some negative energy there and they were interacting and you pulled them apart and you got this one in trouble and you got that one in trouble more. And then when you come to the, to actually sit down and talk with everybody and work it all out and you realize, oh, I totally got the wrong kid in trouble. You know, like it was not their fault. They did everything that I've told them to do. And that little stinker was the one who instigated everything. And I let that one off, you know, I've done that more times than I care to uh, remember. Um, but, but look at what they are experiencing in their life. Try to get into their head and experience like just one situation, like a meal time or a getting ready for school time or getting ready to go out the door time, anything, pick anything and, and try to get into their head and see it from their perspective. It will change you. It will change you and it will make you a better parent. Every time you can try to do that, just that little exercise, just a little bit here and there, it will make you a better parent. Um, and I never, I'm not saying to like give in to your kids or be really loose with them or anything that, I mean, I am, you know, I, I, my kids know and they obey and they follow direction and all that stuff. I was pretty, uh, consistent <laughs> about that kind of thing, but I've started paying attention. Um, I'll be a way better grandma. And I think that, you know, that's one of the things that helps you to be able to do that but um but if i can share that with other moms who are still being moms right now oh my goodness you know if you could take that for what it is just me giving it as an offering to you um with no judgment and try it out i promise you it will make a difference um any comments on that Looking to see, don't want to leave anybody out. Okay, I'm going to look at the comments here from Kate. We've fallen out of the habit, but at the end of the day, I used to ask my kids the same three questions I learned from my mission president. Awesome. What went well today? What could have done, gone better, done better? What did you learn? Or what is something you learned today that you didn't know before? It was amazing what came out of their mouth. Yeah. And to be able to take that time, honestly, how much time is it? You know, I would look at the end of a day and when I had a really good day and interacted with my kids in a way that I felt so proud of myself for, I was like, you were a good mom today. That was awesome. I would look back and if you were to count the number of minutes in the day, I don't know if it would have even added up to an hour some of those days that I thought I did such an amazing job. 
I mean, really truthfully, I mean, some of the times it was more because we were, you know, it was an outing maybe or something like that, but, but it was, it was a sincere, um, honest, I can't think of interaction, you know, with my kids, it was real. And that meant so much more to them than the, you know, so many other days where I thought I was doing great and important things for my kids. You know, you can do stuff for your kids and you can do stuff with your kids. And the with seems to have a much bigger impact. Um, Ida gave us that link. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. You can find him by looking at what he's wearing in that, in that one. It's really good. I really like it. Oh, there are so many videos. I'm going to start putting links to the videos, the really good videos in my emails because there are wonderful emails. Um, I mean, wonderful emails. Hello. There are wonderful videos out there that will, you can just listen to or watch and that will just give you wonderful, amazing things to help you as you're laying this foundation for being able to be brave and go out there and warm your children's hearts. The benefit to that is you warm their hearts and then they're receptive and they want to receive the stuff that you bring to them next. You warm their hearts and they have this natural curiosity and they want to get out there and they want to learn more about the things. And they do. Um, you warm their hearts and they become better, richer, more wonderful people. And they grow up to be amazing human beings that you like and want to spend time with. I love my big kids. I, I'm, I, I'm having so much fun being here with Stevie and his wife, Amanda, and just hanging out with them. I, I love that. My daughter, Sarah, my next one, having her be at home and having these amazing conversations with her as an adult person. And my next daughter, Kate, and being with her and being with Michael, who's my baby and 18 years old and so much fun. I just absolutely love them but they are good people. They love the arts. They love music and art and nature and poetry and storytelling and did I leave something out? I don't know, whatever, all that stuff. They love it. It's a huge part of their lives. There's something there. There is a connection. And if you can create that connection in your children, they will go on to do great things. I mean, I don't mean like big, huge, world-renowned things, but great things, great things that will help them get closer to their Heavenly Father, that will help them be more successful in their lives, that will help them on their journey to return back to Heavenly Father. Really, that's what you want. If I could remind moms of, of you know, one thing that I think is the most important is that your goal is not preparing your child for college. That's never been my goal. And if that is your goal, fabulous, that's wonderful. And you can have that goal. And probably the things I say, you're going to go, yeah, I'm probably not tuning in next week. That's just not really my thing. Because you want the other path and you want people to bring you all of the things you need to do that. And that's a worthy goal. That's completely fine. But in my head and in my heart, I am preparing my children for eternity. So that's my drive. That's the thing that that motivates me and that's why all of this stuff that's on the well-educated heart just fits in and it is what it they, those are the tools you need to be able to do this there is an introductory course for you to take as a mom there is a mother's university for you to take as a mom for you to do as a mom you let ida saying yes 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 good 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 lindsay i know is also on board she loves marlene she was one of the ones that told me about it years ago when I should have jumped right in. Um, and I, it, well, I said this earlier, it's so interesting that so many of us were exposed to it and just kind of, we were focused on the intellect part, the mind part, instead of the heart part. And so we didn't go there. And now that we have, we're sorry we didn't do it sooner. You know, it's just so wonderful. Um, but but you go and approach their hearts and you teach them that way. And I know I have no idea what I started saying. So I don't even know. I jumped off of it to, to share again to Marlene. I don't know why you guys listen to me. Honestly, I, I am always floored at the end and I go look at the recording because I have to look at it a little bit when Michael's editing it for me. I'm like, honey, just edit it. I don't want to watch it. It's like, mom, you have to because you have to tell me, you know what. And so I watch it and I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, I'm a crazy person. And I, I uh, anyway, 
Um, and maybe you all are just in, in cahoots with Kathy and she's saying, you just need to be nice to her. That poor lady. She just, you know, her kids are moving out of the house. She's got, you know, she just needs some support. So just log on and smile and nod your head and, you know, it'll make her feel better. <laughs> anyway, but I'm here. So if you need some you're doing great. Uh, well, you're very kind, but if you need support, I mean, I'm going to be your big, biggest cheerleader, you know, rah, rah, you're doing awesome because this is no small endeavor. This is such a wonderful gift that you are giving to your children. It's absolutely amazing. What you think inside your heart when you have those moments where you are on and you are feeling like, you know, you, you are not, not in what you're doing homeschooling wise, maybe, but you, your passion for why, for doing it. When you're feeling that passion and everything and you feel all of your reasons for homeschooling and you feel that love for your kids and you're feeling all of that and nobody else seems to get it and nobody's giving you credit for it, you know, um, it, that thing that you're doing, that moment that you're feeling connected, all those good thoughts and everything, that's real. That's really all of those things that you think. Um, this is so important and I have to do this. This is something I know my kids need. It's true. You are right about that. And then in all the other moments when you're questioning it, questioning yourself and wondering what the heck am I doing? Why am I doing this? Am I just nuts? Am I messing up my kids? All of that is wrong. All of that is just that all, all of the questioning that we do to ourselves but your initial wonderful um, dreams and ideals and everything that you feel in your heart, that's real. And it is wonderful. And I applaud all of you for having the courage, um, having the love for your kids um, to do this because it is, like I said, it is no small endeavor. It really isn't. And it just, it can tear your heart out sometimes, <laughs> like piece by piece, but I promise you it's worth it in the end. It is worth every bit of it. And it can be fun the, to the level that you, to the extent that you relax and just let things happen, it will be more and more fun and it will be, it will be easier and less stressful. You know, when you push something that you're trying to have happen with the Lord, you know, and you're trying to make it happen the way that you want it to happen. And you're just so sure that the way you see it is the only way and the right way and everything. And then, you know, after you get hit over the head a couple of times, um, you finally start to accept the, God's will in the situation. And then years later, you look back and you're so grateful that you finally listened and followed his path and you can see how your path was never going to get you the way you know where you wanted to be and his just made so much more sense and you can see that now now granted that doesn't happen with all of our interactions that way but every once in a while we have that one where we can see the path more clearly and we can understand why he led us a different way it's kind of like it's kind of like this you know if you can let go and have faith and let the Lord direct you in your learning with your kids, you'll have all your questions answered. And it might be, it might look a little different than what you thought it was going to look like at first. It might look exactly like you thought it was going to look like at first, but he's going to help you along the way either way. That's the best way to do it. Um, oh, you guys are so wonderful. Wonderful comments. Okay, Lindsay, Shel Silverstein has some silly, gross, boy-friendly poems. Yep. Or finding poems about things that they're interested in, baseball or dragons or, or whatever. And memorizing poetry, highly recommend it. So awesome for your kids. We talked about that a little bit last week and my Sarah using Shel Silverstein's poems for the kids that she's working with. And in, on the third day, they had memorized um, one of those poems already. Awesome. Um, okay, I love the support from like-minded women. It really helps me. I am a verbal processor, and so being able to listen and talk about it with others really helps me. Thank you for that feedback, Ida. I appreciate that. And Kate, yes, what Ida said. Wonderful. Uh, that's, and then from Ida, that's so alienating when somebody uses that approach or attitude with you. Thankfully, Heavenly Father is way more patient with us. I know. Can you believe it? Do you ever find yourselves correcting your children about something and giving them 
the inspired counsel that you need to re to give to them oh my goodness it seems now like every time i do that if the counsel's coming out of my mouth and i'm going oh my goodness that was his that's his counsel to me the thing that i've been praying about or the thing that i've been struggling with or whatever and and as i'm telling them and i am i i just feel it completely my whole body is is just um in agreement with this counsel and i know that it's right and i know it's the answer and i know it's exactly what they need and if they'll just listen to it then it will solve that problem or whatever it is and um and then i think oh lori okay are you as as able to receive that do you realize that that same enthusiasm that you have about this answer you need to have about receiving it for yourself Ugh, that's hard it's mom moments okay anybody else any comments any questions before we um yeah go kate were you going to say something I was but it sounds like I'm going to oh, oh oh sorry anybody else ready to share something maybe i just heard go, ahead, go ahead kate yeah Okay, so um, I don't I don't know if you are familiar with this book, but um, a dear friend of mine um, gave it to my son when he was eight years old, and, and he had just gotten baptized. So it, you know, around that age, I would recommend this. You know, six to ten probably. Um, but it, you know, the dangerous book for boys, and because it has so many really. I think innocent and um, pleasant, fun things like how to even build a tree house was one of them and stuff about astronomy and it's random, like the topics are all over the charts, but it's so fun because it's just a quick one page, you know, maybe two or three pages of um, different items. Well, he also has seven poems every boy should know in there. So if you have this oh. book, it's page 185. Um, you could maybe find it in the uh, library as well. That's a, a possibility. But um, I just I just came across that because I thought I bet books for you know something for boys that just came into my mind. Um, That's wonderful. And they want you to show the book again, Kate. Can you show the book again? Yeah. Oh, let's see. And then on that uh, se a separate subject, but. If Lori, you need a topic for another day as well. Um, I love the idea of you doing a story time and it, maybe it would require a little bit of heads up ahead, um, prior, you know, so that I can get, wrangle my kids to all be here at this time. But I'd love for you to read them a story and talk about it and just share, you know, that'd be fun. That's an idea if you would enjoy that. And then, oh, um, yeah. yeah. And then another, oh, yeah. <laughs> that would be, and it would, we could discuss it and, and share, um, you know, your thoughts and have them speak up and maybe it would be a little bit rowdy, but maybe it would be just cool. Like a, a story time, you know, on zoom. <laughs> so, and the poem page is 185 if that is helpful. I love it. I love it. And Lindsay also shared that there is a version for girls too, called the daring book for girls. Okay. Oh, good. So, oh, yeah. That's good. Wonderful. And now you've got something else. Yes. Yeah, last, last note. I wondered if you have read this one before. Um, a meeting with the principal, and it's not principal, it's principal. Yeah. Of, um, value, you know, and education to usher in the millennium. It's by Allie Cannon. And I'm going to not probably do the last name justice, but it's like Eisenach. Or something like that a meeting with a principal anyway my mom sent me this book um so and and uh i i'm not finished with it yet so i'm not ready to do a discussion on it um but every single page has filled me with enthusiasm and you know enthusiasm means god within right so i have like everything she's saying so, something on that page will just inspire me and encourage me and much like what these meetings are doing they fill my heart and um so that i can go and fill my children's hearts so um anyway it's very uh, it's a beautiful book it's very short you can see it's small and but powerful and so um i just wondered if you had read that this is the type of book that i could see 
being a really great discussion on one of these days. Uh, material. Wonderful. Wonderful. I will get that. That's, I just starred that. And I didn't know that enthusiasm means God within. I didn't know that that's beautiful. Yes. It makes sense because that's how I tend to feel the spirit. The strongest is that I, in the, in the missionary training center, other sisters would start to cry when they felt the spirit and get all choked up and emotional. And I'd be bouncing out of my seat. I couldn't, I couldn't sit still. I was like, this is so great. This is so great. <laughs> so um, it, it was awesome. so funny. That's where I learned that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, um, thank you so much. I love to get book recommendations. Um, I wanted to remind us of what Kathy shared last time when she was talking about being on her mission and what her mission president's wife did when they had zone conferences. Didn't you love that? She shared with us that when she went to zone conferences, her mission president's wife would bring a storybook and she would sit all the missionaries down and would read them a story. And she said, Kathy said, the room would just get so quiet, you know, so everybody was just sitting and listening. And there's nothing like having a story read to you. I just absolutely love that. It's a great, rich experience. And we all need more of that in our lives. You know, you can be on either end of it and it's a great experience. So um, yeah, flush that out if you want. I would love to do story time. I don't, you know, Zoom's so weird and kids have all the, you know, their school assignments and everything on there and amazing resource, but um, I'd love to try it. So I'm game, definitely game. It'd be a blast. Okay, ladies, anything else before we, we head out of here? Hope there was some positive here and even just connecting with other moms, knowing that you're all in the same boat, that you've got other people who understand what your week is like, you know, and can sympathize with you. So I think that there's value in that too. Um, I want to say one more thing before we sign off. Um, this has nothing to do with homeschooling, really, but more about us as moms um, in, in the time that we're living. I've been kind of getting really um, anxious, like, what should we be doing and focusing on to prepare our kids and our families? And someone had mentioned that they had read or listened to all of President Nelson's talks since he became an apostle. They just gone back. And I thought, well, that's interesting, but that's probably quite a few talks. And so I looked it up and found um, a website that had them all listed, even like BYU speeches and things like that he had given, or um, state conferences or whatever that were, um, or, um, you know, recorded. But anyway, I thought, isn't there a YouTube video where I can just press play and listen while I'm getting ready in the day and listen to a new talk every day? But there isn't. I couldn't find a compilation of his talks, all of them. So I've just been doing, um, I've been searching for a President Nelson talk every morning and then added it to a playlist. So I will share that playlist with you guys. It's just President Nelson's talks. One was from 2009, one was from 2006, one was from, you know, and then of course in April and I, I, they're all over the place. But whenever I listen to them, it's a very similar feeling of just prepare and have faith and listen and to spiritual promptings and um, to stand up for what is right. And it's really been really fascinating. So I encourage you all to search out President Nelson's talks as mothers and in this time when we are wondering what is going on and what we're supposed to be doing, because that help, has helped me a lot. So I love <laughs> that. I absolutely love that. And I would love to get that link, that playlist. I mean, okay. Let me share with you this last quote, because I think this is part of that message. And it is from Mothers of Influence. That's a page that Marlene Peterson has um, available for us if we want to create small groups of mothers who are supporting each other in this call that we have for the end of the world, you know, this idea. Anyway, she says, we have a sense of a safety net spreading over the earth. It is made up of homes where goodness and beauty are being nurtured and safeguarded in the hearts of the coming generations through art, music, poetry, and stories. We invite you to gather with other women and increase your capacity for light as you learn the art of cultivating hearts.